They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9-12 Wednesday, April 13th. This is the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. I want to congratulate the Brooklyn Nets and especially, especially, especially my New York Rangers for clinching playoff spots. Hopefully we got a fun spring coming up in the city. Good morning. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And staying on the subject of New York sports, I went to the Yankee Red Sox game at Yankee Stadium on Saturday. A beer, $15. Are you kidding me? Just one more reason to hate the New York Yankees. (laughs) Jonathan Green, general manager at DJ Stable. And for those of you who watch our podcast on video, keep an extra eagle eye out for when we do the interview with, uh, with Alan Foreman. Watch Bill Finley, because at one point in time during the interview, you'll see Bill smile just like that. And it's not because of anything that we said or that Alan Foreman said, and he was a great interview. It was because the Boston Red Sox tied it up in the top of the sixth. And you see Bill Finley break character and actually smile for once. It was a beautiful <laughs> thing. In game five of 162, no less. Also, Bill, how much are the beers at Fenway? $14? They're not 15 I, I, have, I don't remember, but they're not 15 Come on, $15 for a beer. You got to be serious. I thought when you go to Fenway, you just put the Sam Adams in your pocket and walk in. Is there that you what go, you did? Yes. So, guys, yeah. uh, we can't see it right now because we're in the three shot. But I finally put a calendar up behind me, and it was March. It was, it was on March last week. Like, come on. Nice. You guys got to help me out on this kind of stuff. I finally have a little bit of a background, and I already screwed it up. Well, I, I know we're on a delay. I didn't think it was that much of a delay. <laughs> The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. The catalog is now online for the April Horses of Racing Age sale after the races on closing day of the spring meet, which is Friday, April 29th. Approved supplements will be accepted until sale date. You can visit april.keeneland.com for more details. So this is super refreshing. We're just going to talk about races this whole episode. I don't remember the last time on the Writers Room we didn't have a trainer getting suspended or a lawsuit to discuss. We're just going to talk about racing for this episode, and we're going to start with the three-year-olds. It was a phenomenal weekend of racing at Aqueduct, Keeneland, Santa Anita, all across the country. We obviously had the three major preps, the final preps, um, for all intents and purposes, for the Kentucky Derby. We had Zandon winning in in the bluegrass. Uh, We had a great finish with Mo Donegal just nailing early voting in the wood. And then we had Taba, who was a kind of a uh, under-the-radar horse in the Santa Anita Derby, but broke out with a big performance. And adds the intrigue of Amir Zidane now having a derby horse after the whole kerfuffle with Medina Spirit over the last year. But I'm curious, which one of those horses was most impressive to you guys and why? Well, Joe, that's an easy one. It was Zandon in the bluegrass. I mean, all three horses were good. All three horses have a chance to win what is a tr- very, very wide open Kentucky Derby. You know, we can talk about that a little bit later, but I, I foresee a five to one favorite. Uh, in the race. But, um, you know, what made Zandon so impressive was was how he overcame the, uh, the the trip. And, you know, he was he was back early. It was actually after three quarters of a mile last. And that's after Pratt tried to make a move and kind of ran it. He didn't do anything wrong, but he was just sort of behind a wall of horses, had nowhere to go. He gets gets back to last with three, at the three quarters. And at that point, if you bet on him or if you're rooting for him, if you're Chad Brown, you probably think, well, you know, I'll be happy to run third. Uh, at that point, and he just motored when he got clear, uh, got a found a path, sort of two, three pass off the rail and 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 got the job done. I think, you know, he may have a chance to be the favorite in the Kentucky Derby because I think that's going to be sort of the, the buzz race, his bluegrass going forward. Um, Mo Donegal was good because he ran down early voting, who really had everything on his own way uh, on the front end. And early voting is, is, is a good horse. And then Taba, you know, could he be the favorite in the Kentucky Derby? Um, you know, it, you it, it's you won't have the Baffert mystique per se, because it's no longer a Baffert horse. But look at what he's done, how remarkable it is to go from a six furlong maiden race to win the Santa Anita Derby. you got to be super, super good to do that. And also, um, among all the uh, horses that ran over the weekend, his 103 buyer 
was the best of the bunch. Uh, Zandon 98, Modonical 96, uh, Epicenter Office Fairgrounds race, the uh, uh, Louisiana Derby of 102. So, you know, do the the buyer numbers on Taba, do they make him the favorite? Uh, Epicenter, does he become the favorite over some uh, decisive wins in um, Louisiana? Or does Zandon the favorite after uh, overcoming sort of a troubled trip? I think those three will buy for favoritism. And right now, I couldn't tell you who'd be the favorite in there. I think, you know, Zandon was optically the most impressive, uh, not only because of the way he did it, but also the horses that were in the race. Um, top to bottom, that was, in my estimation, the, you know, the hardest um, prep with uh, the Wood Memorial being, you know, closest second and uh, Santa Anita being the, the least uh, difficult out of the three. Um, but Taba just really impressed me. And, and, and I always have an East Coast bias. And so for me to, to you know, to be impressed by, a West Coast runner, um, especially being that it was his second start. I mean, he went from six furlongs to nine furlongs. So he increased his, the distance of, of, of his previous race by 50%. And, and I know that history is against him, being that he didn't start until March and it's going to be his third start in the Derby. Um, but man, he, you know, he just, he fulfilled it. As difficult as it is to say, he fulfilled the $1.7 million price tag um, that, that he was. I mean, he, he really, you know, jumped up and, and is is very, very impressive. And, and again, I, I usually discount the horses that come in from the West Coast because, you know, they don't have the, the, the depth of field like we do here in the East or the Midwest. The preps aren't, aren't nearly as tough. Um, and these horses, it seems like the buyer numbers are always inflated when, you know, when, when you get these West Coasters coming in. But, you know, as far as looking at the three races, um, I thought his was the most impressive. And and Modonical, you know, I picked him for my for my my team uh, for the contest, and he just kind of grinded it out. I mean, he he started a big move, and which was you know Rosario moved him you know as early as he could to make sure that that he could get some some room, and he just kind of wore down early voting, who was in front almost from the get go. Um, and I think they both kind of lucked into it because Morello had such a bad break; he broke poorly and it stayed last. And I think um, you know that that changed the landscape of the way that the race was going to be run from the get-go. But guys, I, 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 you know, I hate to admit it, and it's why I'm wearing my Del Mar shirt today, but you know, this horse from California may be the best one. And if not, Messier still be, may be the, the horse to beat, um, being that he was you know, coming off a layoff and, and is in a new barn and stuff like that. The West Coast may be the way, uh, to, you know, the way into the Derby at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you guys that visually I thought Zandon looked the best out of any of them because because of the kind of trip he had. And I thought that that was just one of those races where, you know, it was pretty clear in the stretch which horse was going to get 10 furlongs and which horse wasn't. Um, and I say that as a fan of Smile Happy. I, I picked him in the contest and, you know, I didn't think he, he ran poorly, especially it was only his second start as a three-year-old, only his fourth start overall, I believe. Um, so I, I thought he ran okay, but in the, in the stretch, he Zandon really just powered away from him. And it seemed to me that he's clearly the horse that you want going 10 furlongs. The only thing about him is he doesn't get out of the gate all that well. And that could be a problem. You know, it, it's, it's just one of those truisms. I think that, you know, you don't have to be super close to the pace in the Derby, but in general, you don't want to break slow and have to pass 18 or 19 horses. It's just too tough of a task, even though, you know, it's been done over time. Monarchos, mind that bird come to mind, but you really need a total meltdown if you're not, you know, within the first 10 or 12 horses in the Derby. So if he can get out of the gate and Flavian Pratt, you know, how's that, how's that, how's that move for Flavian Pratt looking so far moving East? You know, there are some people who question whether or not you wanted to be a medium fish and a big pond and, and et cetera, looking pretty good so far, had an incredible opening weekend at Keeneland, as I expected him to do. He's one of the best in the business. Um, but yeah, he's, he's a writer that I think can, can get some speed out of a horse that doesn't necessarily have that speed. You know, table looked great, but to this to the point that John's making, like it's just hard to get excited about these five and six horse fields and a horse that you know really had a good trip. I get that he had to run down Messier, who's a really nice horse, and I didn't think Messier was particularly stopping in that race. I thought Tabor really went and got him, so he's obviously super talented. But it's just he he had that easy, you know, just kind of sit back, make one run trip. You know, Forbidden Kingdom made Messier work a little bit before packing it in on the turn. Forbidden Kingdom is not going to go to the Derby. Um, Richard Mandela announced over the weekend. So that's that's interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about the Derby and, and spin it forward uh, later in the show and, and what the pace might be like, especially 
Forbidden Kingdom being out of the race, I think, definitely affects that. Classic Causeway also might be out. So we might get a derby that does not have quite as much early speed as it looked like, you know, two, three, four weeks ago. Um, as for the wood, you guys mentioned it. Morello breaking slowly completely changed that race coming out of the gate. Um, I thought Mo Donico got a typically good ride under, under under Joel Rosario, finished up strong. You know, early voting, I like him a lot because he's, you know, he's only had a couple of races, but he's never going to have an easier time of it than he did on Saturday. And he still couldn't hold off Mo Donegal. So even though I think he's a really nice horse and I think he's he's got development still to come, I don't know how you project him beating Mo Donegal and then like eight or nine other contenders in the Derby, even if there is not quite as much speed as we thought there might be. But I wanted to ask about Taba from you guys because – now, there is a lot of discussion about going from a six furlong race to a mile and an eighth race to then the mile and a quarter Kentucky Derby, which is arguably the big, arguably the biggest test of a three a three year old can possibly have, at least in North American racing. And a lot of people are are criticizing because Amir Sedan made that decision. He's admitted it. He overruled Steve Young and Tim Yachtin to run that horse in the Santa Anita Derby. It obviously looks smart today. But I think people are worried that, you know, running him in that race and then running him in the Derby four weeks later with so little season it might burn him out for later in the year. What do you guys think? Do you subscribe to that theory? Uh, Joe, I do. Uh, I mean, it could be a factor, uh, you know, if he run 17th in the Derby because he's just not ready for that challenge. Uh, then, you know, you you lose a big part of your year and maybe you don't see the horse come back till the fall or anything like that. But I, I talked to Amir Zadan uh, earlier in the week and, you know, what he said was it's the Kentucky, based on paraphrasing, but he said was my whole stable, my philosophy is geared around trying to win the Kentucky Derby. I have this horse that has an incredible talent. I've got to give him the shot here. So I think the big risk was going in the Santa Anita Derby. Now that you've passed that test, I think going in the Kentucky Derby, which is now at this point is a no brainer. You're not possibly going to win the San Diego Derby than not go in the Kentucky Derby. But I, I think that that is, is less of a test. I think he passed the big one, the real big one. And now he goes into this. And, you know, 15 years ago, I might have said a horse like this had absolutely no shot to win the Kentucky Derby. But look at Justify. And I'm not saying he's Justify, though he could be. But you know, he had only three races going into the Kentucky Derby. Uh, uh, excuse me. Um, yeah, three races going into the Kentucky Derby. And his um, also started, what, in March or February of, uh, of his year. So this horse is justified less one race. He skipped the uh, justify was maiden allowance, Santa Anita Derby. He went uh, maiden, Santa Anita Derby, Kentucky Derby. So, you know, it, I think what justify proved to us all, especially in this day and age, you know, None of the horses going in the Kentucky Derby will have 18 lifetime starts or even 10 lifetime starts like they used to even going back, you know, 15 years ago. So Justify proved that in the current environment where horses are so lightly raced that if the horse is that good, he can pull this off. So, again, I'm not saying he's Justify, but I'm not going to look at him in the Kentucky Derby as a handicapper and say, no, forget about it. Uh, yeah, could he run 17th and could they look in the mirror and say, you know, this was just too ambitious? Yes, that's possible. But you certainly can't blame him for trying it. Well, John, I just I wanted to ask you, too, as an owner, because I think it, the worry isn't just that he's going to run up the track in the Kentucky Derby. The worry is that you might burn him out for the rest of his three year old year. What do you think? I think as an owner, if you're going to pony up one point seven million dollars for a horse, you have one goal in mind, and that's to win the Kentucky Derby. And, uh, and and the owner said it, and, and I understand his mindset. If you're going to put that much money into a horse, um, then the only way, the only way you can get out on it is if you win the Derby or the Breeders' Cup. Um, he's so close to the Derby right now, and everyone's got Derby fever that you, you can't, you have to run him. You have to run him in the race. And, you know, the nice thing about picking against the horse in the Kentucky Derby is that, you know, you have a one in you have a 19 and 20 chance that you're probably going to be right because there's only going to be one winner. So there's a 5% chance that you'll be wrong. So a lot of people can point to this horse and say, he's going to bounce. He's not, you know, he had it his own way, the two races. Um, you know, he trained in Santa Anita and ran in Santa Anita. And now he's got to go across country and he's got to train in a different place. And the spotlight's really going to be on him. And he's then going to be in the barn of Tim Yachtin really for a significant period of time before he runs and does he do things differently than back? There's a lot of questions that need to be answered for a horse like this. 
um, and, and and everything has gone has broken the right way for him since he started. Um, so yeah, you know, you can you can root against a horse like this um, in the sense that you don't want the big money to win, you don't want um, you know the, a Baffert esque horse to, to win. There, there's a lot of reasons to, to root against him, and again, you'll have a 95 percent chance that you'll be right um, that he won't win. But you know, as a fan of the industry. I would just and, and and a podcaster. Wouldn't you guys just love to see this horse win and see the owner standing there with the trophy as Churchill Downs has to like begrudgingly hand him the trophy? And what do you think the post race interview is going to be like? I mean, how awesome would that be? You talk about sound bites galore. We're not going to need to have you know any any you know other stories for like three or five you know different podcasts after that. It's going to be fantastic. So you know, on the one hand, you know, as a traditionalist, I say. It's going to be really hard for this horse to win the Kentucky Derby, but man, as as somebody you know who, who loves the game and loves the intrigue, I would really, really like to see this horse hit the wire first. John, one thing I, I want to interject: I, you're going to be a little bit disappointed because um, you know Amir Zidane. You know, some people, if they would win the Kentucky Derby in his position, would just trash Churchill Downs and say, you know, you, you know, na 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 na, I sure got even with you guys. Uh, he's determined to take the high road so i'm sure yeah, unfortunately so we want to see you know some mud slinging here uh give us good uh, fodder for future podcasts but uh that's not the right thing to do and he's figured that out he's a classy guy um he, he really is and uh you know talking to him uh yesterday i mean you know obviously he want to i mean everybody wants to win the kentucky derby he wants to win the kentucky derby times a hundred because of what happened <laughs> last year but uh he's not going to uh, wag his finger at anybody or 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 do anything like that. I think right. he understands that probably wouldn't go over well, though we wish he would. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, he he didn't want to gloat he didn't want to gloat or, or wag his finger to you, Bill. But when he's in that winner's circle, I don't know. I I, I would wager on the on the phrase cancel cancel culture being uttered. Ah. <laughs> if, if he wins that race, we'll see. <laughs> The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. You know, we already talked a little bit about the bluegrass, but it was an incredible weekend of racing at Keeneland last week. We're going to talk about some of the other performances after this break. Um, it's important to note that both the Ashland and the bluegrass winner, Keeneland September sales grad Zandon, sold for $170,000 to Mike Ryan. And Nest was a $350,000 yearling for Eclipse Thoroughbred Partners and Rapoli Stable. So now we look forward to this coming week of racing, which will be highlighted by the grade one Maker's Mark Mile on Friday. Big, big mile turf race for, for older horses. And the grade one Coolmore, Jenny Wiley Stakes on Saturday, plus the grade three Stone Street Lexington Stakes, which is the final points race towards the Kentucky Derby. And we are less than two weeks away from our live show from Keeneland, which is going to be April 26th. We cannot wait. Uh, I'll be down there for the weekend's racing beforehand. So give me a shout if you want to meet up and Grab me a beer or something. Cannot wait for that Keeneland meet. It's been my first time at Keeneland, as I said last week. What, John? John's laughing at me because I'm already trying to get free drinks out of this. Well, yeah, it's not. It's not like Yankee Stadium where it's fifteen dollars for a beer. It's it'll <laughs> so, be it'll be less. Yeah, I'm sure you can afford it, Joe Bianca, Mister Mister Two Show, Joe Bianca. <laughs> that's okay. But if someone wants to buy me one, you know, I, I won't <laughs> be bashful about it. But yeah, it's it's going to be great. Uh, so much great r- racing still to come. It's going to be hard to top opening week at Keeneland, but. Uh, you know, still plenty of stakes, two-year-old races and allowance. Today's card, honestly, I was looking at today's card. It's just a Wednesday. It's a great, great card of racing with a lot of really nice three-year-olds and up-and-coming horses. So we're right in the thick of it now with this Keeneland meet. I'm looking forward to the rest of it. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. With all eyes on the bluegrass this spring, there's no better way to take in the action than Friday, April 29th at Keeneland. And they're off. We get into it with hip number one. Good luck. Featuring a day filled with world-class racing, followed by a unique sales experience in the evening. The April Horses of Racing Age sale. After the races on closing day of the spring meet. <laughs> Follow the action this April to Keenan. Maximum security proves he's the real deal with a gate to wire win in the Florida Derby. Champion three year old. Maximum security has won the TBG.com Haskell Invitational. 11 triple digit bias. Maximum security. He smoked them in the cigar mile. Grade one winning four year old. Maximum security takes them all the way in the TBG Pacific Classic. Secure your mayor's future. Maximum security. 
The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. We say it every week. It was a big weekend for the Sires at Ashford Stud. First, we have to mention Golden Powell, who we're going to talk about a little bit by Uncle Mo and his impressive win in the Grade 2 Shaker Town Stakes, owned by the Coolmore Partners. So congratulations on a great win. What looks to be an exciting year for Golden Powell. Uncle Mo's other son, Mo Donegal, won the Grade 2 Wood Memorial at Aqueduct and Wit who was such an impressive two-year-old for his sire practical joke last year, returned a winner in his sophomore debut in the grade three Bayshore Stakes. Desert Dawn, by my favorite, Cupid, won the grade two Santa Anita Oaks for trainer Phil D'Amato. So a lot of really exciting horses coming up on the horizon, already with big races this year from Coolmore and Ashford Stallions. And I'm especially looking forward to that Cupid filly the rest of the year. So we lost Bill to the Matrix. Uh, I don't know. He took the blue pill, I guess. Which is the which is the one? Which is the bad one? Uh, it, so Bill's had technical difficulties. Uh, so we may or may not get him back later on the show. Probably not. Uh, so it's gonna be just John and us taking you the rest of the way. And it was such a good weekend of racing that I feel like we had to we had to create a second segment for it beyond just the three year olds. Um, you know, he had Nest winning the the Ashland, who was so impressive in the Ashland. Had that wide trip and just exploded away in the stretch. Um, and then the other two horses on the undercard races that, you know, I, I think are just going to have incredible years are already off to great starts are Golden Pal and Speaker's Corner. You know, I've been on the Speaker's Corner bandwagon for a little bit. I thought his race in the Gulfstream Mile was a real breakout performance. He backed that up with an incredible run in the Carter, got a 114 buyer. It seems like these one turn horses are just popping out these 110 plus buyers these days, you know, faster and more with more frequency than I ever remember. Um, and, and obviously, Golden Pal setting that crazy pace in the Shaker Town and still ran away in the stretch. John, some of those horses had to blow you away, no? Oh, you know, you start, start with Speaker's Corner. I mean, here's a horse that, as a four-year-old, has really found his groove. He's, he's undefeated this year. He, you know, won this, uh, the Carter Handicap Grade 1. He won the, uh, the Gulfstream Mile and the Fred Hooper, um, respectively. And, and, you know, Joe, really, the only bad race that he's had in his career – um, was he he ran kind of a, a really you know lackluster race in the Pennsylvania Derby and that was you know coming off a lifetime best uh, 101 buyer sprinting at Saratoga and I think maybe they just jumped him up a little too soon in, into the deeper waters but ever since he's come back he's he's run nine times in his career he's got six wins a second and a third and more importantly he's just consistently improving he every it seems like every time he steps foot on the racetrack um, he he blows through that glass ceiling of, of his previous best. So he's a horse that's got a tremendous future. Um, you got to figure, you know, at a street sense, out of a Bernardini mare, um, you know, it's right up Goldolphin's, uh, you know, magical formula. And uh, this is a horse that may be um, this year's the 2022 Knicks Go, where a horse that just goes to the front and leaves everyone else behind. And they'd be curious to see if if he can you know, stretch it out a little bit more, or if they're going to keep him going the, you know, the one turn mile or, or, or a two turn mile. But um he is just dominating that division, and it's not an easy division to, to be involved with. And the, if it wasn't for Speaker's Corner, the race that I'd be talking about right now is Golden Pal, because here's a horse that it seems like every time he steps foot on the racetrack, which is unfortunately infrequently, um, you know, he, he just he, he breaks through another phenomenal barrier and, and, and sets up and does well. He won that last race at Keeneland with a 109 buyer, 109 buyer. And that division of the turf sprinters, um, you know, a lot of horses in that in that field, in, in the Breeders' Cup field last year, are no longer racing. Either they retired a stud or they got they got injured and permisses the most recent one that, that looks like he's going to, you know, had a career ending injury for, for Joe Orsino and Breeze Easy. And, and now he's going to be uh, retired permanently. So Golden Powell is going to be, you know, really uh, having an opportunity to pick his spots. And I know after the race, um, it wasn't just, you know, I wasn't the only one who was so impressed with him. His trainer, Wesley Ward, was speechless. And for Wesley to be speechless, it's really an unusual situation. But they interviewed him right after the horse hit the wire. And he was he was like, I, I don't even understand what I just saw. This horse has just been so impressive and it's such a treat to, to train. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But it sounds to me, Joe, like they're going to bring Golden Pal overseas and run him at, at Royal Ascot and take on the best uh, turf sprinters there. And uh, I, I think for the, you know, for this Uncle Milk Colt, it's game on. Yeah. And I just, he, there's also the plan to run him in Australia before he retires. So he's got, a, he's going to have a lot on his plate the rest of the year. And, and we can't wait to see him in general. I don't love the American horses going over to Royal Ascot. Like I love it from a sporting perspective, but in terms of like their chances in betting them, I don't love them. 
Find me a better five furlong turf horse in the world than Golden Pal right now. I think you could be hard pressed to find a horse who's going to beat him in the King Stand, which is where he's going next. And he's just so fast and just explodes out of the gate. And, you know, it's a little different from the Del Mar race to what happened this past weekend because the Del Mar race was five furlongs. Like John said, it wasn't the greatest turf sprint field in the world. Just got out of the gate and, and just ran them off their feet. Different doing it on a deeper turf course, going five and a half furlongs at Keeneland and to go 20 and four and to keep going like he did was just unbelievable. And just going back to Speaker's Corner for a second, man, if we can ever get him, flight line and life is good. Can I interest you in that threesome in the Met Mile? Because I don't know that we've seen three better one turn horses at once, at least in my lifetime following racing. I think that those three are probably the best three horses in training right now. And it just so happens that they're probably all better around a mile. So I'm just looking forward to seeing them clash later in the year. And it's, it's, it was great, not just to see the big three-year-old performances, but to see those other horses that you can get excited about some of the older horses, because, you know, it's just, it's just a, a typical refrain in racing where you don't get to see superstars that get retired too early. These are two horses that you're going to see, unless they get hurt, the rest of the year do some really, really special things, I think. Allow me to reintroduce himself. His name is Bill Finn to the Lee. Welcome back, Bill. Oh, well, it's good to be back. Uh, some little computer glitches and everything, but uh, here I am. Um, so what else, did, other than the three-year-old races from the weekend, what were you most impressed by? Well, uh, everything you guys said, I guess. It's, I, I don't know what you said, so I don't know what to add to it. Uh, I caught the last uh, a couple words about Golden Pal and uh, Speaker's Corner, and I uh, absolutely agree with, with everything you had to say, Joe. I mean, two fantastic performances. I don't know how much you touched upon the three-year-old fillies, which I've been uh, uh, watching um, – because I do the top 10 for the uh, Kentucky Oaks for the TDN. But, um, you know, we talked about how good these horses are. And in the Ashland Nest on the Friday before the Bluegrass was just absolutely terrific. But again, she's only gonna, she's going to be six to one in the Kentucky Oaks because it's such a deep race. Uh, another horse that emerged from the Kentucky Oaks uh, was Nostalgic in the Gazelle, who's kind of an interesting horse. Um, very well bred, kind of didn't get her act together until just recently for trainer Bill Mott. Again, you know, in some Kentucky Oaks year, she would be four to one. She'll be 12 to one. But, uh, you know, an absolutely very good race. Uh, one other thing about um, Golden Pod, I don't know if you mentioned, but um, about their future plans, very ambitious. Uh, they're still talking about going over to Australia with him, which would be fascinating. And Wesley Ward uh, told me uh, a few weeks back that they're interested perhaps in running him on the dirt at some point this year, just because, you know, it's, there's, you have nothing to lose. Uh, but if he wins a dirt sprint race, that makes him even that much more attractive as a sire prospect. So it looks like they're intent on having a lot of fun with him this year. And uh, yeah, he's a real exciting horse. Just he's as fast as fast can be. He, he ran second in his one dirt race. And I, I was I love that he he's just like Lady Shipman because I loved Lady Shipman as a turf sprinter. And she was just like him. Just blasted out of the gate, had great speed. Um, so it's 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 fun to see him kind of emulating her characteristics. There's one other one other horse I wanted to mention from the weekend, um, from from Friday actually, uh, from the uh, the Transylvania Stakes a horse that I gave out on the show, Side Dog. I think we have a picture of him that we can put up. No, 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 no. That's Side. That's my dog, Side. We, we need we need the horse, guys. Someone's gonna get fired for this. We need the horse's picture up there. There we go. That's that's side dog. Um, so maybe maybe you just John. He said off the air he needs to start naming his horses after my dog. So uh, <laughs> I thought Coinage ran pretty well, but side dog was was just too ferocious in that race. So it was it was a phenomenal phenomenal weekend of racing, and you know it's always good to break it down with you guys. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Lane Zen. Lane Zen Stallion of the Week this week is Honor Code. Grade 1 winning son of AP Indy was recently represented by Grade 3 Fairground Stakes winner Cavalry Charge, who's a West Point horse, and Grade 3 Palos Verde Stakes winner Essential Wager. Of course, his leading performers to date include Grade 1 winners Max Player, Maracuja, and fellow Lane Zen sire Honor AP. Honor Code stands for $20,000 at Lane Zen. And we'll be right back after this message from Lane Zen. Catalina Cruiser. He won seven of nine starts coast to coast with six triple digit buyers and five dominating graded stakes wins, including a record in the grade two true north stakes, a son of leading fifth crop sire, Union Rags. 
a $370,000 yearling with an imposing physical and one of the best of his generation. There's only one Catalina Cruiser, now standing at Lane's End. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high as his average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Breads, breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. The CDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Kentucky Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders. Kentucky Breds have dominated on the road to the Kentucky Derby, winning every single 100 point derby prep race in America this year. Epicenter, White Barrio, Cyberknife, Tis the Bomb, Mo Donegal, Zandon, and Taba were all bred in Kentucky. You can find your next Kentucky bred at the upcoming OBS April two year old sale. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we're thrilled to bring back onto the show this week the chairman and CEO of the Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association, Alan Foreman. Thanks so much for coming back. Gentlemen, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. Great to have you. Looking forward to a good conversation. So we'll start off with the return of the match series. The match series starts this weekend. Uh, it was a popular program in like the late 90s for people who don't know. And then it went away for a while, came back in 2018 and 19 and then missed one year because of COVID, came back again last year. What's been the reaction like from the horsemen, from the betters, from the tracks? And, and what are you looking forward to this year? It's all been great. Um, it's hard to believe I started this 25 years ago and the industry was different then. The environment was different. We started differently. And what we tried to do was just take a new event for racing, brand it, um, try to bring the region together. You know, the Mid-Atlantic is the largest concentration of racing in the United States on a daily basis, particularly in the summertime. We thought we could put a competition together in various divisions and try to identify the best horses in the region. And we branded it. We had our own logo. We started a website. Back then, there wasn't a lot of, there was no social media presence, let alone um, how you market today. And we were doing a lot through um, industry publications, um, the Daily Racing Forum and the like, but it caught fire. And uh, back then, uh, Graham Motion won the first uh, match series, the beginning of, of Graham's great career. Um, Sam Huff, the great um, Hall of Fame football player who passed away recently, one of his great achievements in racing, always said, was winning the match series. He won it the second year. And we ran for five years, as you indicated. And then, as is typical in the industry, infighting, other circumstances caused us to, you know, cease the series. But horsemen kept asking to bring it back. And um, uh, we, when we started working together in the region on health, safety and welfare reforms and coming out of the, um, the crisis at Aqueduct in 2011-2012, the conversation in the region started about, well, if we're going to be working on health and welfare reforms and other things to achieve uniformity, why not bring the series back? I mean, the catalyst was the horsemen. They really loved it. They missed the series. But this is not an easy undertaking. You need track cooperation. You need funding from horsemen's organizations for the bonuses. You need the tracks to contribute money for marketing. It's a, it's a large undertaking. You have to coordinate schedules. We brought it back, as you indicated, in 2018 to great success. And then we decided in 2019 to try big event days. Let's group the races at each track and create a big event day for each of the tracks. Tremendously successful. We put together a great schedule for 2020 and COVID hit. Decimated the series. Um, we brought it back last year, but only two tracks really were even in a position to do it. So Maryland and Colonial did a, a placeholder series last year, and now we're back this year, and we've got uh, Maryland Jockey Club tracks, Laurel. Uh, Laurel. We're going to be at uh, Parks, Penn Gaming, and Colonial, and we've got a great series that will spread over just a little under six months, 20 races, five races in four divisions each, and the horsemen will be running for $2.2 million in purse money and over $400,000 in bonuses, and they love it. And um, the betters love it. Uh, we've seen handle increases every year. I think they look forward to it. And 
the fact that we are just trying to market and promote the sport, which there isn't a lot of right now, um, just just speaks to the benefits of it. And look, we do what we can to hold it together. It's not easy. Alan, I want you to um, continue on that uh, pathway about it, quote unquote, not being easy. Um, I noticed there's no New Jersey in this year and no Delaware Park in this year. How hard is it in an industry that was notorious for people not getting along and being dysfunctional? Uh, I mean, it's not just you, you, you know, you need to get the approval and cooperation of, as you said, several horsemen's groups, racing commissions, different racetracks. At the end of the day, do you ever feel like pulling your hair out? Oh, well, you have to be patient. And you have to just stay at the table and you have to be willing to accept setbacks and you try to work your way through it. I have a great team, by the way, David Richardson, Maryland Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association. Tom Lamara works with us and great support from the horsemen's organizations. But at the end of the day, it's about selecting the appropriate divisions that you think will be best supported by the horsemen based on the existing horse population, which has been shrinking, um, identifying those divisions and then grouping the races together. And one of the understandings that we have in, in the, uh, in the uh, series itself is don't compete against your fellow racetracks when you're trying to get the horses to work through the series. And that presented a problem for Monmouth Park, which has the unique problem of not only trying to salvage and promote their very strong stakes program, but they're competing against the Naira tracks. And so it's not as easy for them to cooperate with the other tracks in the region when they have to schedule their races. And that was certainly one of the impediments this year. Delaware Park has new ownership and their focus is on their Del Delaware certified program. They wanna put money into their own program. And so they just decided to sit it out this year. Uh, fortunately, with the strong support of the horsemen in Pennsylvania, in Virginia and Maryland, we were able to hold the series together, but not only hold it together, but I think we've put a pretty good schedule together. And I think it's going to, you know, even when we had just two uh, states last year, two tracks, it, it was very, very successful. So people identify with the series. It's an opportunity for the horsemen in the region to get into the series and try to earn bonus money and feel like, you know, the whole point of this was for owners and trainers to feel like they're participating in a Breeders' Cup or Triple Crown type event that would get them invested throughout the summer. And it's just, just an incentive for, for owners to want to be in the business, enjoy the business. And we've seen that in every one of the events. And, and Alan, you, you, re you referenced uh, the stake races. And just for the audience that, that doesn't know, um, each stake race in the series at a minimum is $100,000, with some of the stake races being up to $150,000. That's just purse money only. And the distances... Um, you know, range in the in the turf route races from a mile, a mile 16th to a mile and an eighth. And for the sprint divisions from six to seven furlongs with a couple of six and a half furlong races in between. Um, it, are there other divisions that you think would, you know, add value to this match series? Are you looking to expand it to two year olds or, or, or anything or any other uh, you know population of horses? Well, a lot of it's driven by available money. I mean, we, we don't want to spread too thin. We want there to be value and we want there to be impetus to want to participate in the series. So we don't want to water it down. And the more you add divisions, at least from the bonus money standpoint, it reduces the amount of available bonus money. Remember, I've only got four horsemen's organizations, uh, five that are, are participating this year, and they, they really have stepped up. And the tracks have to be willing to commit marketing dollars to do this. That's not easy in today's world. So, you know, interestingly, when we started the series in 1997, we were running all graded stakes races. I mean, this was a high end series and I did it pattern after the American Championship Racing Series that had failed. And I thought, well, why can't we take that series? and Why can't we group a bunch of divisions together and do something that, that is very similar, but would spark greater interest within the region and perhaps nationally? And that's what happened when we when the when the environment changed, when the industry changed, we started talking about, you know, let, let's really do this for the mid-Atlantic horses, not horses that are going to come into the series, go to Saratoga, you know, go to Breeders' Cup and are really looking just to uh, find races to work their way into uh, Saratoga or bigger events. And um, so we, we put a minimum floor of one hundred thousand dollars for every race, which is still pretty darn good. And um, the, to the horsemen's organizations and tracks credit, to the extent there wasn't a stakes race, they created one. And um, 
Uh, it just it gets sizzle to the program when the horses come out on the track and they're wearing the match series saddle claws and the, the grooms are all coming over the hot walkers with match series hat logos and um, everything is branded. It, it just has a different feel about it. And you can just tell on the reaction of the fans when they're there. And we see it in the wagering patterns. Yeah. And it's honestly for that region, especially, I think it's so valuable because I think it's, I mean, we've talked about this on the show. There are so many tracks in a relatively small part of the country um, that there can be a lot of overlap and a lot of redundancy. So I think that that's, especially in this region, region is very helpful. And just for anybody uh, who wants to check it out, the first race is this Saturday, if, if I'm correct, the Frank Whiteley stakes, which is the three-year-old and up sprint division in the match series. That'll be at Laurel this Saturday. Just wanted to shift gears a little bit because we had you on, if you remember, right after the Medina Spirit Betamethasone positive came out last year, which feels like a lifetime ago, honestly, with all the stuff that's happened since then. But we had you on as, as you, put on, you put on your legal expert hat and kind of predict what would happen going forward. I feel like even you could not have imagined all of the processes and appeals and stuff that has gone on since then between Bob Baffert and Naira and Churchill and the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. What's your reaction over the past year? And we finally got to a conclusion with this 90 day suspension. But you now what's your reaction from all this legal back and forth? Well, it, 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 Joe, it certainly highlighted what people wanted to see changed about the industry. I mean, when we talk about HISA and we talk about um, the manner in which um, our rules are adjudicated, it isn't so much that our underlying rules are problematic. It's just the enforcement process and the way that justice is meted out and the way people can game the system and otherwise. And this is a textbook example. It, you know, the, the public doesn't understand the difference between the actions that racetracks take and the actions, the regulatory actions that the racing commissions take. This is a regulated business. And the underlying disciplinary action for any trainer who has a, a, a violate, medication violation is done by racing commissions. Tracks have their own uh, private property, common law private property rights, with the exception of, of Naira. But and so in this instance, Churchill exercised its private property rights. Um, there's a lot of confusion in the public as, as to how those two intersect. But Churchill took an action separate and apart from whatever the racing commission was going to do. At the end of the day, I think that um, this this all went downhill when Bob had his press conference the day after the Derby. You know, the rumor was around that there had been a positive test of the Derby. There was no uh, confidentiality, and he actually got in front of the story. But when he came out and said he had no idea how it could have happened, and within five days the story came out as to how it happened, he was boxed into a corner. And, you know, unless he wanted to accept responsibility and take the punishment, which was, you know, a historic loss of the Kentucky Derby and everything attended with that. He, he wasn't prepared to do it. And so this has played out in a in a sense where there's been really no exit strategy, you know, it, 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 on either side, quite frankly. And it's been forced to play out, which is what it's done. I think Churchill, by taking the action it did and making very clear that it wasn't backing down, I think started to press the Kentucky Racing Commission to uh, to move more expeditiously, which obviously here we are now, but it, it just took way too long. And that's, that's not acceptable to anybody. Alan, switching gears again, um, one of the things that you've um, accomplished in recent years was you were a major player in the idea that the Maryland racetracks would be redeveloped, which settled all the problems with whether or not the Preakness would leave Baltimore or not. It's been quite some time since the um, the bill or, or the legislation went through to put forth all this money to completely rebuild Pimlico and to do much of the same with Laurel. But not only has there been no shovel hitting the ground, we don't even hear anything about this. So, you know, uh, this is a very exciting development for the future of not just Maryland racing, but racing in general, uh, you know, to have a state of the art Pimico to replace, uh, you know, a, what is right now is a terrible facility. Um, where do things stand and, and, and why hasn't there been more progress on this? Well, it's a great question. And I'm about to tell you that, that there has been progress and some pretty significant progress. But in, in order to understand that, let me just give you 30 seconds of background. Three years ago at this time, the Strana Group had pretty much threatened to move the Preakness from Pimlico to Laurel, and they were seeking to build a super track at Laurel. Uh, it angered the legislative leadership in the state, and it angered, extremely angered the city of Baltimore. 
And the city of Baltimore instituted a lawsuit against the Strana Group to eminent domain Pimlico and the Preakness. Uh, not long after I was asked on behalf of the racing industry to represent, I was not asked by the racing industry, I was asked by the powers that be to represent the industry in very high level uh, confidential negotiations on a possible settlement of that lawsuit. And the upshot of the three months and four months of work that we did was the concept plan that was approved by the General Assembly that would redevelop the Pimlico property with a new clubhouse at Pimlico, but uh, the Strana Group would only conduct a short meet for the Preakness at Pimlico, and that property would be a redeveloped property during the remainder of the year, and that racing in Maryland would essentially consolidate at Laurel Park, which needed substantial upgrades and renovation. We estimated that our plan would cost $375 million to be financed through the sale of bonds by the Maryland Stadium Authority, which is world-renowned. Now, Camden Yards, which was 30 years old yesterday, was built by the Maryland Stadium Authority, and I think still stands as one of the great stadiums in any sport. And um, so the Stadium Authority takes over. First, we get hit with COVID. We have design issues, particularly with respect to what our concept plan at Laurel was and what needed to change, uh, so potential supply chain issues, and the project has gotten over budget. And so we went back to legislative leadership with the stadium authority in the session that ended yesterday. And the result is money has been allocated from the capital budget for certain portions of the project, extra housing, demolition, et cetera. The Maryland, uh, there is a significant tax issue that nobody has heard or talked about that involves the Laurel property and it involves a capital gains tax. I hate to get in the weeds, but it's critical. There is a capital gains tax that attaches to improvements that are made to public arenas like or public spaces like Laurel to the owner of that facility, which is, in this case, the Strana Group. It's a massive capital gains tax. It is an impediment to this plan going forward. And the only way around that tax problem is to convey the property to the state, to the local government or a not for profit entity, none of which. The state doesn't want to acquire the racetracks. The local county doesn't. And so it begs the question of a local, uh, of a 501c3 or a tax exempt organization doing that. The Maryland Economic Development Corporation has been authorized to appraise the Laurel property and to investigate the feasibility of the acquisition of the Laurel property by either a government entity or a private entity that we would set up. And we are undertaking negotiations with the Strana Group on not only what would involve the acquisition of Laurel, but future operations. Our 10-year agreement expires this year that's governed our relationship with the Strana Group for the past 10 years. And so that's all part and parcel of this deal. And those reports and those analysis have to be done by September 30th. And the Stadium Authority is charged with coming back to the legislature by January 1 of next year with a final plan for both Laurel and Pimlico. But with respect to Pimlico, the legislative leadership insists that Pimlico go first and not Laurel, and that we move as quickly as possible to get Laurel uh, to get Pimlico started. So I think you can expect sometime after January 1 of 2023 for that portion of uh, Pimlico, the old grandstand that has been condemned to hit the wreckers ball sometime after the first of the year to begin the construction at Pimlico. And we need to finalize, which is very complicated, by the way, extraordinarily complicated, the plan at Laurel. Uh, I would just add that there is no playbook for this. No project of this kind, particularly in horse racing, has ever been undertaken. So we have no, no book to follow, no anything. And we're feeling our way through this as we can. I think the delays, at least in the politicians' eyes, are a little bit unacceptable. And so we are now accelerating to move that program forward. There is design work that needs to be done, infrastructure work, and you should not anticipate construction before January 1 of 2023. But on that schedule, Pimlico would be finished in time for the 2026 Preakness and Laurel, substantially will be completed by then, but a clubhouse at Laurel probably wouldn't be completed until 
2027, 2028. In the meantime, it's anticipated that the Preakness will still always run at Pimlico, even during construction. And, and, and that's that that helpful. <laughs> that was that was no, but but thank you for pulling back the curtain because so many of us, you know, are so anxious and chomping at the bit for for you know for this renovation to go through. But it makes more sense. There's always legal and tax implications whenever you get a project of of this magnitude. Um, Alan, you know, you've been so successful with the match series with your work um, as the uh, chairman of the Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association. I know I've worked with you with Nitha and Naira and, and just been amazed at, at what you've accomplished. If you could be czar of racing for a day. What would you wave your magic wand and fix? Well, I think those things that I would fix are being fixed. Uh, look, I'm a health, safety, and welfare guy. I, I, you know, I got into that when when I worked with Scott Palmer and Mary Scully and Jerry Bailey when they had the fatalities at um, Aqueduct in 20, uh, 2011, 2012. And that drives everything. I, I know that a lot of people talk about our medication scandals and Bob Baffert and everything that's consumed the industry over the past year. But horses dying on the racetrack is our single biggest problem. OK, and if we don't solve that problem or manage it and manage it well, you know, our, our future is not great. So I am, you know, I, I the expansion of the Horse Racing Integrity Act to include a safety program was the most important thing that happened. It's why it got our support. And I think it is the most important part of the HISA program. OK, so I'm happy with that. I, um, you know, it is very difficult to market our sport today with the vast competition we have. I know a lot of people think that sports betting is going to be the panacea. I, I, I'm not I'm not invested in that uh, at all. But, um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's harder and harder to get everyone to work together. Because a lot of jurisdictions are in survival mode or they have become so dependent on gaming for their futures that um, we're in such a vastly different place than we are. Um, so um, for me personally, Zara Racing, no Zara Racing is going to accomplish anything. The single biggest thing is the uniformity that I think Haiza is going to bring. And then, um, you know, Look, we've got to do everything we can to um, to get racing to continue to be as popular as it really is. I mean, it really is kind of a, a little niche business that is, you know, I, I know the revenues are down, but revenues are down in baseball. Revenues are down in every sport. Viewership is down in every sport. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we accept that. But, you know, I go to tracks and I see lots of people and I see people having fun and I see people on their on their devices, um, embracing racing. And I, you know, I, I am, I'm very comfortable with that. As far as I'm concerned, I think the Maryland, what is potentially going to happen in Maryland, including its future operations, could set a, a different tone for the industry going forward and could help to invigorate the industry. Uh, so I'm really bullish on that. Well, can you expand on that? What do you mean by that? Well, I look, um, in my view, look, we don't we don't have gaming in Maryland. We we have been able to survive over the past decade when we were at death's door by going into partnership with the Strana Group. Essentially, we we helped to fund the operations and still to maintain year round racing, which you don't see in a lot of states. You see boutique meets. And we've been able to maintain a very good purse structure. And it's a great, great place for horsemen to be. But the reality is if the Stronach Group wanted to get out of the business in Maryland tomorrow, I don't think there's an operator in the country that would be interested in coming into the industry as it's structured in this state. And so we are we have the opportunity now through this redevelopment plan and what the legislature is asking us to look at to imagine what the future could look like with a redesigned industry. And that goes to the way we operate. And so we're going to explore the various opportunities to do that so that we can preserve our business for the 30 years that these that, that the bonds are going to you know finance these projects and beyond. Um, racing is part of the heritage and culture of this state. And um, I've been very clear with the governor and legislative leadership that if you don't support what we're doing here, you're going to lose a very valuable industry to this state. And I, I think everyone's invested in it. So I think we have a unique opportunity also to embrace 
new technologies, and there have been discussions about that, that we, we could be the lab experiment for new technologies. And we're going to be looking at that with experts over the next three, four, five months. So, uh, you know, stay tuned for Maryland, because I think really good things are coming down the pike. Alan, you mentioned uh, sports betting, and I agree with you. I don't think it's a panacea for racing. I think, matter of fact, in, in my opinion, it could be anything. But but there's so much talk now about, well, if we better, if you can't beat them, join them. Go into fixed odds wagering. Let a guy go on FanDuel and bet the Knicks plus three and also the seventh race at Laurel. Uh, is that the answer? And do you think that uh, 10 years from now, fixed odds betting is going to be a big part of, of the way people wager on horse racing? Well, you know, historically, fixed odds wagering was not really something that was very popular in this country. And I, you remember uh, Dennis Drace had started exchange wagering at Monmouth, and it, it didn't produce any, any revenue. That was kind of the forerunner for this. Um, you know, I have a different view on fixed odds than I did. You know, from a regulatory perspective, we were always concerned about the integrity of the race. And when you go to fixed odds wagering, can you really protect the integrity of the race? But now we're getting into a sports um, betting environment where, you know, the NBA isn't regulated. Uh, uh, bask you know, college basketball is not regulated. The NFL is not regulated to the extent that we are. And I don't think anybody's looked at that aspect of it. So fixed odds wagering certainly introduces an integrity issue. But I think that um, and from all the experts I've talked to, you know, if you don't embrace fixed odds wagering, you've really got no chance going forward because there is an appetite for it. And it does provide an opportunity for those who may not understand the daily racing form, who may not understand Equibase, who find our, our sport too difficult to embrace, that there is an opportunity here. And, um, you know, in our, in our sports betting law in Maryland, we protected ourselves that you cannot conduct fixed odds wagering in Maryland without the approval of the horsemen, breeders, and the racing commission. So we left the door open, but it's got to be on our terms. So um, uh, we'll see. But I, I think we're moving in that direction. I, I do. Are the numbers going to be big? I, I, I don't know. I, I just don't know. But I think we, you have to do it. I think you have to be competitive in this marketplace. Well, this is the last question for me. Another thing that racing has to do is get everything unified. And you guys, the THA, have stood out by being in support of HISA. There are a lot of horsemen's groups that have tried, sued to try to stop it from coming into effect. Uh, you guys have always been on board. Um, unfortunately, the USADA aspect of it and them taking control of the drug policy broke down, as people know. So this is kind of a two part question for me. One, you know, you don't have to divulge specifics, but why do you think that that those negotiations broke down? And two, you said something interesting before about how the safety protocols are still just as important. Can you be specific on that? So the USADA program relates to medication. Let's, let's say the, the, the HISA anti-doping and medication control program relates to medication. The safety program relates to every other aspect of the health, safety, and welfare of the horse and rider. Okay. And that, as I said before, relates to um, um, what I think is the most important part of the HISA program, because horses that are breaking down on the racetrack are our worst nightmare. Um, horses aren't dying on the racetrack because of medication. Okay. It is a, when horses break down on the racetrack, it's multifactorial. For example, we just did our review of, of the breakdowns in the mid-Atlantic region for the past year. Maryland was having its lowest incidence of breakdown in its history until the track went bad and the track failed at Laurel in October. And we had a cluster of eight breakdowns in the span of three weeks. We got right on it, but it blew the numbers. OK, so there was a racetrack surface issue not a medication issue, not a training issue, not an issue of horses with pre-existing injuries that were being put on the racetrack. And the value of that safety program is to work with everyone on, on racing surfaces, on identifying horses at risk so they don't get the track when they shouldn't be, and, and everything that's attended with that. With respect to medication, you know, the, the rub with the Horse Racing Integrity Act was that, that USADA would come in and run the anti-doping program for the industry. They would have been in charge. And there was substantial opposition to that in a lot of places. And so when the Horse Racing Integrity Act was modified 
It allowed the authority that's been created to contract with a third party to run their anti-doping program, not USADA's anti-doping program. So I think it broke down for, I, I think, for three reasons. Number one, USADA came out with its program independent of HISA and marketed its program to, in my view, force the authority to enter into a contract with them. It didn't give the authority the option of trying to find the best vendor to provide that service, number one. Number two, they released their proposed rules that were available to everyone. I'm assuming maybe you all looked at it. If you could figure them out, if you could understand them, if you could, because they were taking the rules from human sport and superimposing it into racing, which you cannot do. And if you can tell me that their rules were better than what we currently have, you know, I, I, I beg to differ with you because there's nothing wrong with our regulations. It's the enforcement and consistency and uniformity of our regulations that hides us solves. And then the third thing is cost. I mean, I don't know directly, but I heard that the USADA program would have been crippling from an economic standpoint, both to racetracks and horsemen. And so I think the authority did the right thing. They, under the law, were not required, as some groups are saying, they were not required to contract with USADA, and they have now gone out into the marketplace. And well, I think they're still talking to them. And I, I saw yesterday Lisa Lazarus, who, by the way, is terrific. Um, she announced that they probably will be making an announcement. I assume it's going to come right around the derby uh, of who their uh, vendor is going to be to complement the anti-doping program. And that's a work in progress. Uh, that program has been delayed to January 1. So the safety program is going into effect on July 1. Uh, the anti-doping program is delayed until January 1, 2023. Well, it's good to hear that the wheels are in motion from you. And that's another one of the reasons we like having you on the show is you're privy to these kind of things. And every track and every jurisdiction could use an advocate like you, Alan Foreman. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Don't forget the match series starts this Saturday with the Frank Whiteley Stakes at Laurel. Alan, good to talk to you, man. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Alan. You Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Alan Foreman will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. The XBTV workout of the week this week is Edgeway, who is best of 22 five furlong workers on Monday at Santa Anita, going in 59 and two fifth seconds, which you can see right now if you're watching the video version of this podcast, which you should always be doing. Uh, the John Sadler trainee ran second in last year's Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint. I gave her out in that race, if you remember. And this year has reeled off two straight victories in the Kaluk and Queen Stakes, one of my favorite name stakes in the country and the grade three Las Flores stakes. So we're looking forward to her campaign the rest of the year. Might think about something like the, uh, maybe the La Troyenne if you want to stretch her out, but if not, probably pointing towards the ballerina later this summer at Saratoga. So if you want to see all of the Derby workers, all of the Oaks workers, definitely go to xbtv.com. Uh, so there was there was an accident last week at Aqueduct with uh, Julio Pazua, who is an exercise rider who, who uh, had a horse had a cardiovascular incident and was injured. Um, there was a GoFundMe page uh, posted by Aaron Yagoda, who is a NYTHA board member. And Aaron is coming on right now to, to talk to us about the campaign. Welcome, Aaron. Hey, thank you, Joe and John. How are you? 
Good. Uh, g- good to have you on. And it's a, it's a great thing that you started for Julio. Can you just tell us a little bit about what happened, what he needs in terms of medical procedures and how the community has responded? Sure. It was uh, April 3rd um, at Belmont Park. It was a training accident. The horse had a heart attack. Uh, Julio unfortunately landed on his head. Um, the horse, which happened to be my horse, passed away. And uh, Julio was, didn't have any feeling from the waist down on the track, but he was feeling his arms. And they rushed him to the hospital. Um, they, they, the next day, he had surgery. Uh, he had two cervical fractures in his neck, and then he has a fracture in his spine. Um, he now can move his feet, not strong enough to walk. Um, and he, he could flop one arm around, and one arm is not really working. So he's having really trouble in, now from the waist up. Um, he just got moved last night to the Kessler Institute. He was at Winthrop Hospital until last night. I went to go see him, and they were in the middle of moving him to the Kessler Institute in West Orange. And he has a long road of recovery for uh, any partial paralysis he might have, or hopefully when the swelling goes down, maybe he'll regain full mobility of all his legs. But his attitude, Joe and John, it, you couldn't you couldn't meet a nicer guy. I walked in the first day, and I'm saying, so Julio is everything. Oh, don't worry, Poppy. It's part of the game. And you know, how's the horse? And and that's just how the racetrack really gets together and really loves each other. And even though we compete, and I said this before on another show, you know, we compete against each other. We chase the same horses. We chase the same dollars. We, you know, we, we fight amongst ourselves when it all needs it. The racing community really comes together as a family and uh, we pick each other up. And and Aaron, it's it's a wonderful thing that that you're doing, not only following up with with Julio and his family, but also establishing the GoFundMe page. Um, Have you been surprised at at just how much has been raised and, and donations as of now? It's um, just over twenty one thousand dollars raised, and over one hundred and sixty people have donated yeah. money. Yeah, I was. I didn't know when I. I never set up a GoFundMe before. I actually, had my my daughter had to help me, and um, I, I didn't know what a goal was. I didn't want to put a goal that was like unattainable, and I didn't want to put a goal that was too low. So I, we just picked twenty thousand dollars, and this morning we passed it. And if you look at the people, the list of people that have donated. Um, you know, trainers and jockeys and, and just the, the uh, fan that put in $10 and they send you a little note on the side. And I'm trying to thank everybody best I can. There's some kind of link. I, I think I got most of the people thanked. I'm trying to reach out and make sure I do that. But if I don't, if anyone's listening to this, I want to publicly thank you for, for donating, keeping Julio in your thoughts. So this money is going to go right to Julio and his family. Um, it's going to be used to help Mrs. Pazua go visit Julio because he's going to be in West Orange. They live in Floral Park, New York, but they said this is the best facility for Julio. So she's going to stay in a hotel at times. Um, the safety net, the jockey club safety net, they, they reached out to me yesterday. I spoke to them. They're going to help him with his rent and his mortgage or whatever he has. I don't know which one for the next couple of months. Um, I'm going to reach out to the Knight of Benevolence and uh, hopefully, you know, it's going to have to get Julio used to his new form of life and, and his daughters and his son were very appreciative. And uh, Julio is really loved by everyone. I mean, I, I want to show him not even the money that was donated, but all the outpouring of support. I was at the track the other day, and one of the agents said, oh, if you see Julio, tell him Jean Cruguet, who called the jocks room, wanted you to pass on the hello to him. They play cards together. So it's really nice. Yeah. And like you said, you know, there's as much infighting as there is in this industry, it, when stuff like this happens, it really it, it is heartwarming how much people will rally around, you know, fallen riders and just people who are, who are on in, in hard times. So we appreciate you organizing that GoFundMe. Uh, you can see the link. We'll put up the link on the video version of the show. But if you're listening to the audio version, it's GoFundMe slash F slash help dash Julio dash Pazua. P-E-Z-U-A is how you spell his last name. So Aaron, you go to thank you so much for doing that. And thank you to everybody who's donated so far. Please, if you can, uh, listeners and viewers of the Writers Room, go donate as well. Thanks for coming on, Aaron. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, John. Let me just jump in one other thing. Don't forget also that that the link is also going to be on the TDN website. So you can just as easily go to the TDN website and uh, and find the link, uh, you know, for the GoFundMe page for for Abilio Pazua. um, And if that's an easier way for you guys to find it. So um, we're trying to make it as as easy for for people to donate as possible. We know it's going to be a very long road for him. Um, $20,000 is a great start, but it's just that it's just a start. So, you know, please give what you can. Thank you, guys. And thank you to TDN for keeping the link on there. I appreciate it very much. Okay, so Bill has been banished to the shadow realm once again. Um, He's having a little bit of technical difficulties. We're hoping to get him back for later in the show. But if not, John and I will take you the rest of the way. We wanted to talk a little bit about the Derby and Oaks perspective fields because 
you know, we're basically we're basically there now. We're we're about three and a half weeks away uh, from the Derby, and it just you know we, we basically have the field settled. Let me just uh, we'll throw up the, the top twenty uh, Derby points leaderboard, and then we'll talk about our contest. You got Epicenter number one, Zandon, White of Barrio, Modonical, Tis the Bomb, Cyberknife, Crown Pride, the Japanese Horse, Taba, Simplification, Smile Happy, Slow Down Andy, Barber Road, Unoho, Early Voting, Morello might not go. He's number 15. Then Messier, Zozos, Summer is Tomorrow, Charge It, and Tawny Port. The ones kind of on the fringe right now for points are Happy Jack, Pioneer, Medina, Grantham. Uh, rich strike, rattle and roll. So I think other than maybe one or two defections, we're going to have that. that those are going to be mainly the 20 horse f- field that we're going to have. Um, and the Oaks is just as interesting, honestly. The, the Oaks points aren't quite as as important because the Oaks doesn't always fill like the Derby always fills. But man, you got Echo Zulu, Secret Oath, Nest, who we talked about a little bit earlier. I mean, th- there's just so many good fillies to look for. Um you know, John, I, I wonder. Yeah, it's gonna be hard to hard to pick. Let's talk. Let's talk Oaks first. It's gonna be hard to pick. I think between those top Phillies, but just from what you've seen so far this year, who who are you leaning towards? You know, Joe, it, it's interesting because I think that, and we've been talking about this the past few weeks. I really genuinely think that the Oaks is the deeper of the two races, the two three year old races. Um, I wrote down on a piece of paper last night. You know, who I was looking to you know to see and and who I was hoping for that would be in the race. And I have no less than eight Phillies, eight Phillies that I think, you know, are, are legitimate contenders. And you mentioned a couple of them. You know, Echo Zulu is obvious. Um, Nest, who just won the Ashland. Um, Nostalgic, who, who just won the, the, the Gazelle. And then you have Kathleen O, who was a wow winner last time. Um, Secret Oath, who's a really, really phenomenal Philly that ran third in, against the boys. Goddess of Fire. Um, Hidden Connection, who ran second. Um, you know, to, to that Philly, uh, you know, in, in the in the race last week, and Adair Manor. I mean, th- and those are just like off the top of my head. Those were just the top eight that that I could think of. I know that we're not even including like Desert Dawn, who won the Santa Anita Oaks. She's a Cupid, yes, but she sure. won the Santa Anita Oaks. Um, you know, so so there's there's like a whole host of Phillies, and and again, from a pride standpoint, you know, DJ Stable, we've had a couple of really nice Phillies. We won the Ashland years ago, and and Jay Walk won the Breeders' Cup. Um, and, and I would say with all humility that I don't think either of those two Phillies would crack the top five um, of this group. I mean, that's how stacked this group is. And we ran against some really nice Phillies. We, you know, do a style ran against uh, um, MC Hammers, you know, really good Philly and Meadowstar. OK, you know, who, who are, you know, who are Hall of Famers. And then, you know, Jaywalk, we ran against Bella Fina and, and a number of uh, really, really, you know, I think there were five grade one winners when we when we ran um, in the uh, in, in the Ashland that year. So, I mean, it was it, it, those were good fields. This is going to be a phenomenal field. I mean, to the point where I was laughing when I saw this tweet, but somebody tweeted out that uh, they think that the Oaks and the Derby should flip flop this year as far as the calendar. And that the the Derby should be in the undercard on Friday, and the Oaks should be the feature race. And you know what? I, I think that you can make a very good argument of of the case that this year in particular, there are some really good fillies. And if you run fourth in the in the Kentucky Oaks, there's no reason to hang your head because you probably would have run a number that was good enough to win. Um, you know, the majority of the races over the past few years. So, Joe, I'm 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 a Philly guy. I always like to you know to, to root for the Phillies, but. This year in particular, there are some really deep, deep, good, talented Phillies. And not to say there aren't talented Colts, but there are Phillies on this list that I wrote down wows next to in their races. And I didn't write down as many wows for the boys. Well, and it's interesting, too, because we spent so much time talking about the lead up to the Derby and the Derby Trail and the prep season that we kind of forgot about the Phillies until the last month or so when we started to see some of those breakout performances. And yeah, I think out of kind of out of nowhere, the Oaks has, has become the better, more intriguing race. And to your point, you know, Echo Zulu, I think, could run the best race of her life and run fourth in this race, you know, and she's a champion. So I think that th- that really speaks to how deep and how competitive this field is. And, you know, it's great to it's great to have you know, the two big races you're looking forward to. I think a lot of yours is one, either the Oaks or the Derby. I think both are really intriguing. Obviously that we're, we're talking about the Oaks right now. And that's, that's kind of more of the now, more, more of the now race in terms of how these Phillies have come on late in the season, but the Derby's got plenty of nice Colts too. And I wanted to throw up the, uh, the stables points because we're close. We we are coming right down to the wire in the Derby. If you want to put up the standings right now, Al's, Al's narrowly in charge at 270 because he had Zandon, 
win the bluegrass over the weekend. That was his number one pick. Bill is at 250. You had Messier run second. Fortunately, he's not going to have Forbidden Kingdom in the Derby, but he's still got Epicenter who's going to be among the favorites. Um, I'm at 230. Smile Happy ran second for me in, in the Bluegrass. Uh, don't think we're going to see Classic Causeway Cos- Cos- in the Derby. Probably see Smile Happy and White Abario for me. I actually thought Command Performance ran better than it looked in that race, but he's going to be off the Derby Trail. John's got 215. Uh, Mo Donegal winning the Wood Memorial for him. So he, he's right in the thick of it, too. He's got Charge It, Slow Down Andy. Uh, Emmanuel, I don't think, is going to run the Derby. I think they're going to they're take him off the trail now after he ran third in the Bluegrass. And Sue's last. Sue didn't want us to put up the, the, the standings, but she's got the leftover team. So that's like, you know, the, the, we got to put that caveat up there. We'll put in parentheses, Sue Finley, parentheses, leftovers. She's got 25. And she might have Pioneer Medina in that race. And you never know, it's still anybody's game because the Derby is going to be 300 points for the winner, 150 for second, and then 75 for third and 50 for fourth. So even Sue Finley's leftover team still got a shot, but I think it'll be it'll be fun. We'll have a lot of action. I think we'll have like probably half the field amongst the four teams. And, you know, for me, I, I can't get past Epicenter's race. In, in the Louisiana Derby. I, that, to me, was the best race of the prep season. Like, I know we talked about Taba before, and he was really impressive and how good Zandon looked in the uh, in the bluegrass. But I don't know, man. Just the way Epicenter was able to switch off in that race and not be on the lead and was able to go around horses and just, you know, just galloped home in the lane. He's got so much tactical speed. To me, he's the horse to beat. Now, you know, we were talking before, the, the favorite's probably going to be four to one, five to one. We'll get a little bit, you know, we'll get a bit, little bit better idea as the race come, gets closer. But, you know, even at four to one or five to one, if you have a horse that you like in this derby, I say go for it. You know, it's not, obviously, you're not, relatively, you're not going to get the same value as if you like a 20 to one or 30 to one shot and you want to say it's a scramble, you'd rather take a big price. But I don't know. You're not. It's not going to be one of the derbies where you're going to have to eat seven to five or two to one if there's a horse you really like. So you know, if Epicenter is five to one, I don't think that that's terrible value. You know, especially in terms of like keying the horse and exactas and trifectas, you can always get those big exotic payouts in the derby. You're like really all it takes is to get one clunk up forty to one, fifty to one shot in third or fourth, and you almost always get those. It's usually Dallas Stewart. Where's the Dallas Stewart horse? Um, that, that can sneak up and get into the exact at, at 60 to one. But that's my opinion, John epicenter to me still stands alone as the best prep winner. What do you think? I, I think you can make that argument. I definitely think that you can make the argument that he had the most impressive race. Um, you know, Joe, it's interesting in going through the archives of, of the most recent 30 years, um, you, you see some patterns. And, and number one is that, um, you know, over the past few years, the Derby favorite has actually hit the board in a number in the majority of races, which, which is surprising because prior to that, that wasn't always the case. It was, you know, it was like the, the, the Derby downfall. You know, if you were the favorite, it was it was actually tough. Um, something else I thought was interesting is that only two horses in the past 30 years have had triple digit buyer numbers the race before the Derby. So if, if you're looking at that, you say, OK, well, well, Taba, I would knock off then because, you know, the one with the 103 buyer and the 101 buyer. Um, you know, that, that he is subject to bounce for this race, especially that he's been so lightly raced. So there's a lot of reasons to kind of clip off a couple of horses. Um, but if you're looking at, you know, the eye test, um, I think you also have to, you know, look at White Abario. And, and again, I wasn't a fan of his. I, I passed on him, um, you know, after he won the Holy Bowl and didn't think that he was going to be able to stretch out. And, and he's proven me wrong that, that he's run, you know, a couple of really good races. Um, another Florida horse that, that I liked. Um, was uh, was simplification, um, and I think simplification bounced last time. I really feel like that 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 was his race um, that that you kind of put a line through and say, okay, he's coming back into this race and and should be stepping up. Um, but I really feel like that that the winner is going to be coming out of either California, like I mentioned, um, or out of Florida. I don't think the New York preps were that impressive, and I have Modonical on my on my team, but. I just didn't. I felt like he he kind of grounded out. He didn't really, you know, have an acceleration like that 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 you make you go wow. Um, and I definitely don't think anyone out of Oakland is coming in and, and is going to hit the board. Um, and Louisiana, you can maybe make a case for, but a lot of those horses have gone from Louisiana and run at one of the other prep races as well. So I, I think that that the Derby winner is going to be coming either from the Pacific Coast or from uh, you know or, or from Miami this year. Um, and I'm not going too far on the limb to, by, by saying that, but you know, this is a good year. This is definitely a good year to play some long shots because you, 
Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, well, talking about the California horses, it's interesting, like the the the, the additional storyline of Tim Yachtin and Bob Baffert, I think adds a lot of intrigue to this to this derby as well. You know, there's a, there's a decent chance that Tim Yachtin could run one, two in the Kentucky Derby with horses that were trained by Bob Baffert up to a month ago. So, I mean, there's going to be a lot of lot to talk about in that way, at least for sure, I think. And Joe, one of the things like we should be happy that we have, you know, 10 or 11 horses in our in our contest that, that are going to be making the Derby, which is great. But like none of us talked about Crown Pride. I don't even know, you know, coming in from Japan, I don't really know a lot about them other than like the Japanese, you know, came came west and stole our lunch in the Breeders' Cup races. So maybe this is the first legitimate, um, you know, Japanese entry in the Kentucky Derby. And in summers tomorrow, I know like Brary Jones and Airdrie are involved with it. But and he has forty points, but I can't honestly remember watching him in a race. Do you? No, no, that's I don't know, know how how well that speaks to us and how how much we <laughs> we cover international racing on this show. No, but it's true. And honestly, like I hope those horses run well because I just think overall there's better there's better racing in America when there's more international participation. This is more of a recent thing in like the past decade or so where you have these overseas qualifying races. For the Derby. Now, so far, those horses have not come here and done anything. And a couple of them have scratched and actually not come over. But yeah, I wouldn't, you know, I, I'd have to look more at the pedigree because I think that's one of those things um, where you have a lot of these, these qualifying races that some of them are on dirt, but some of them are on synthetic. Um, it's not necessarily going to translate to American dirt racing. So I'd have to look a, bit, a little bit harder at the pedigrees and, and who they were running against. Al, Al's the guy to ask about the Japanese horse for sure. So uh, I'll definitely get his input before we um, we place any bets on the Derby. But yeah, I always love a little bit of international flair. It's it's really made the Breeders' Cup what it is, is all of the international participation. And I don't think it hurts to have horses like that in the Derby or the, or the Preakness of the Belmont either. Yeah. And, and the only other thing I would say is, and, and, and it's only because Bill's not here, so I can take some of his air time. But can we please get rid of the point races at Turfway? There's no way that, and, and no offense to Tiz the Bomb, who, you know, was a legitimate turf horse also, and no offense to, to Tawny Port, who ran second in, in, you know, in those races to, to Tiz the Bomb. But, if, you know, there's no way that, that these synthetic races should have the same point totals as, um, as the other major preps. If you want to say, okay, I'm going to give it the same point totals as the Lexington, for example, you know, make it a 20 pointer or make it a, you know, something like that, then I can understand it. But, you know, basically, Tis the Bomb, in my opinion, is keeping out a more legitimate horse, more legitimate proven dirt horse in the race um, because he got 100 points for, for winning the Jeff Ruby Stakes stake. I said, I will not stand for this Animal Kingdom erasure because he, if you remember, he, he won the spiral and then he came through and won the, won the Kentucky Derby. But yes, in general, I would agree that the Turfway preps are more they're, they're, they're more likely a prep for the Edgewood or the Belmont Derby or, or, you know, a race like that than the Kentucky Derby. So I'll agree with you. And just just for the future now, Sue can never ask Turfway to sponsor the podcast. But All I know is if I was the owner of Pioneer of Medina or Grantham or Rich Strike, I would be I would be pissed. Okay, but it's, not, it's not like those horses did anything great. You know, it's. Understood. We're not leaving out Secretariat here, John. You don't know that. You don't know that because we'll never know. We'll that's never good. know. All right. Maybe well, that's the horse that develops and blossoms. Well, if Grantham runs 224 in the Belmont and wins by 31 lengths, I will tip my cap to you, sir, and say we I got We got about as much chance of that happening as Bill figuring out his computer issues before the end of the show. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at westpointtv.com. West Point Superstar Flightline put in his first work in two months on Sunday. How was this not our work of the week? No disrespect to Edgeway, but Flightline is appointment viewing. Even when he's working out, he went three furlongs in 37 flat. Great to see him. Back on the track, looked like he wanted to do a little bit more in that workout. So we're really looking forward to seeing him later in the year. West Point has a few runners at Keeneland over the next few days. Arabian Prince runs for Dallas Stewart later today, which is Wednesday. Brigadier General is a three-year-old son of Street Sense, runs on Thursday. And on Friday, undefeated Philly Unbridled Mary runs in the Limestone Stakes. So best of luck to West Point and all the partners with all the action this week at Keeneland. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. 
fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Legacy sales graduates continue to pose for the camera in 2022 with 56 winners already. They've earned over $2 million in 2022, now over $138 million all time. Yearling sales coming up before you know it. Give Tommy or Wendy a shout. Here's Remy's cartoon for this week. We are officially on the road to the Kentucky Derby, which, as John can attest, is not an easy road to, to hoe. Uh, you got to turn left on Bloodline Road, go about five, four miles on Yearling Way, right on Soundness Avenue, left on Prep Race Lane for a mile and an eighth, and then jump on Points Highway and exit on Need Luck Boulevard. Definitely a lot of factors going in. It's Derby success. Love that one. Love that one. Okay, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder that the catalog is now online for the Keeneland April Horses of Racing Age sale after the races on closing day of the spring meet, Friday, April 29th. Approved supplements will be accepted until sale date. You can visit april.keeneland.com for more details. And week two of that Keeneland meet starts later today. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, Alan Foreman, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next week.